Let's read a soil triangle. You always, always, always want to start with the clay. You start with the clay and you go this way vertically. All right. So here, let's say we know that clay is 50%. This is 50%. Go this way. The next place we go is going to be silt. All right. So we start here and silt, we do this. So let's say 50% silt. This is 50%. So you just draw it straight through here. It is 50% sand. This is 50% sand. So you just draw a line here. And so maybe you draw this as a cheat for yourself and number it one, two, three, clay, silt, sand. So you know exactly where to go. You first go this way, then you go this way, then you go this way. Let's say you have 20% clay. Again, clay is right here. 20%, that's right here. So you're going to create a line over here. There we go. Next thing you're going to do, how much silt is there? Well, it's about 40%. 40%. You draw the line here. But if you actually look at it, there is an intersection. These lines all intersect right here. 40, 40, 20. And that's loam. <laughs> One thing that they might try to do to trick you is ask you to figure out how much clay percent there is, silt percent, sand percent there is. Here's a trick. The percentages all have to add up to 100%. So if they tell you that there is 60% sand and 20% silt, well, that's 80% total. There's 20% remaining to get 100. There is a 20% clay if they're asking you for clay. And that's how you read a soil triangle. It's actually pretty easy. Okay, next thing. We're going to talk about something that you might have to answer for an FRQ. How would you conduct an experiment to find out the percent clay, silt, sand? Well, you'd get a jar, put soil in it and water, leave it overnight, and you would see that because of their different densities, because of their different sizes, they would separate. So clay would be on top, silt would be in the middle, sand would be on the bottom. Let's say the examiner told you that there is four pieces of clay, two pieces of silt, two pieces of sand. Well, you just have to figure out the percentages. So like four out of eight for the clay, that's 50%. And then 25% for silt, 25% for sand. And from there on, you just read the soil triangle to figure out what soil texture it is. And so if they ask you, how do you conduct an experiment to figure out the soil texture? Well, do exactly what I just said. We have one more thing to discuss with soil. I know you're probably tired of soil by now, but that is going to be soil horizons. Only ants eat breadcrumbs regularly. <laughs> so. O-A-E-B-C-R. Only ants eat breadcrumbs regularly. First, we have the O level. That is organic. And this level is the very top. It's just where organic matter uh, decomposes. So let's say a carcass of a rat is on the soil. It'll decompose over time in that organic level. Next is A. This is the surface um, and also known as topsoil. And this is where both organic material and minerals are. Next is E. This is the layer of dissolved minerals. And B, subsoil has pretty much all minerals. That's what you need to know. And C, also called the substratum or the weathered subsoil, is literally just the weathered subsoil. So it's like B, it has a lot of minerals, except it's a lot more weathered. Now, lastly, we have R, which is the bedrock. This is known as the parent material. And so if there's quartz below every all the soil that formed, the quartz would be the parent material. It's the last 
level and it's called bedrock y'all that's it for soil now we have 4.4 earth's atmosphere let's dig in so there's only a couple of things you need to know for this one first what is climate define it well it's the average weather that occurs in a given region over a long period of time and i'm talking over decades so over your entire lifespan so whenever people talk climate change um they're not talking about the weather which is short term they're talking about long term over decades now let's talk about the different layers of the atmosphere and luckily for you there's only two you really need to know so what are they <laughs> well we have the earth then we have the troposphere then we have the stratosphere mesosphere thermosphere exosphere here's what you need to know troposphere is the closest layer to the earth and the troposphere is just about like you no know, 16 kilometers above the earth aka 10 miles it is the densest layer earth's water vapor is here this is where most of the nitrogen oxygen and water vapor is in the world and this is also where Earth's weather weather occurs. And so if it's thundering around your place, blame the troposphere. So next we have the stratosphere. The stratosphere is about 50 kilometers up. It is less dense than the troposphere. And it actually protects us against UV radiation. If that wasn't there, we would all probably have cancer. So... Thank you, stratosphere. And something neat to know about the thermosphere is that it also blocks harmful X-ray and UV radiation. And this is where we see aurora borealis, like the, the different lights. You know what I'm talking about, the green and the purple lights. That's it for 4.4. And now we have 4.7, solar radiation and Earth's seasons. I have a question for you. Why does the Earth's seasons occur? The answer is because of Earth's tilt. So let's talk about summer versus winter. All right, so what happens in the summer? Well, in the Northern Hemisphere, where I live, summer happens in June, July, August. What happens in the winter? Well, for me, again, in the Northern Hemisphere, some, uh, winter is in December, January, and February. That is not the case for everyone, though. Let's say I was in the Southern Hemisphere, maybe in South America. Well, my summer would be in December, January, February. And in winter, it would be June, July, and August, which sounds so odd to me because I register summer and June. So let's talk about the seasons. What do you know? Well, a lot of them is something you might be tested on. Summer has longer daylight hours, almost 20 daylight hours. Well, winter has eight daylight hours, so shorter days or shorter light days, if that makes sense. Summer is hotter, warmer temperatures, almost double that of winter, which is cooler. Here is another thing. In summer, most solar energy is absorbed. Makes sense. That's why it's hotter. While in winter, most solar energy is reflected. And that is, in the Northern Hemisphere, when does summer occur? And the answer is June, July, August. In the Southern Hemisphere, where does summer occur? Well, here's a way to hack that. Think about wherever you live. Is it in the Northern or Southern Hemisphere? And then you will know uh, when summer or winter is for you. And you just flip it for the opposite hemisphere. So I live in the Northern Hemisphere. And it just makes sense to me that summer is in June, July, August. So obviously, in the Southern Hemisphere, summer is going to happen during December, January, February. I'm actually going to be experiencing winter. Why does this occur, though? Again, the tilt of the axes. So let's say this is the sun. All right. And this is the Earth. Well, when the Earth is tilted this way, guess what? The Southern Hemisphere, this bottom part here, it's getting most of the direct rays. Well, yeah, the Southern Hemisphere is getting a direct hit 
whereas the northern hemisphere is not getting as much, which is why it's winter right now. And so when would this be? When the northern hemisphere is having winter, the southern is having summer. Answer that in your head. The answer is December, January, February. Awesome. And so let's say I'm the opposite. Well, now northern hemisphere is having summer and southern hemisphere is having winter. Let's cover one last thing here. So June versus December solstice. So in the June solstice, the sun is above the Tropic of Cancer and the northern hemisphere is getting more daylight hours than any other day it ever does. And in the December solstice, we have the exact opposite happen. The sun is over the Tropic of Capricorn. And the southern hemisphere gets the most daylight that it ever does. Once during the March equinox and the September equinox, that's um, March 20th or 21st and September 22nd or 23rd, all regions of Earth receive 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness completely split in the middle. 4.5, global wind patterns. What are factors that affect Earth's heating? Okay, we've gone over this. A, angle of sun's rays. B, the surface areas that the sun's rays cover. Remember, the larger surface area that it covers, the less heating it actually gets because the smaller area that gets the same amount of sunlight is going to be hotter because it gets the same amount of attention, even though it's smaller. There's less dispersion. And lastly, the type of surface affects the Earth's heating. So if it's going to reflect it off, well, then it's going to be cooler because it's not absorbing the heat. What are properties of air? This is what you need to know. Well, um, density. For one, less dense air rises while dense air sinks. Makes sense. Next, water vapor capacity. So you have to know this. Warm air has a higher capacity for water vapor. So warm is humid. Pretty easy, makes logical sense. Okay, quick intervention here, because honestly, I'm not going to lie. I kind of forgot about this whenever we talked about it in class. And I was like, oh, that is important to know. So what is at zero degrees? Like, let's say we have the Earth. What is at zero degrees? It is the equator. Yes, you are smarter than I am. <laughs> so um, something to note is that right above and below the equator is something we call Hadley cells. So between zero and three degrees north and zero and three degrees south of the equator, we have cells that circulate. There's Hadley and then there's mid-latitude cells on either side, and then there's polar cells. It makes sense. So remember, Hadley's in the middle, very, very middle. And then we have mid-latitude, and then we have polar. Makes logical sense because polar is going to be at the end, mid means middle, and then Hadley is going to be at the very center. Hadley loves the equator. You can really tell that I need sleep. All right, guys, at this point in time, I really would appreciate if you just left like a positive comment, like you can do this to me. Um, I'm going to be reading this as my future self, but like, I'm just really sleepy and I'm powering through this to get this to y'all before I actually take my test. So, all right. Now, 4.9, El Nino slash La Nina. Okay. So we're going to do a quick review. What are the five processes that influence Earth's weather, weather and climate? One, the unequal heating of the Earth. Two, atmospheric convention currents. Three, the rotation of the Earth and the Coriolis effect. Four, um, Earth's orbit around the sun on a tilted axis. And five, the circulation of ocean waters. <laughs> Basically, a lot of circles, things moving in circles, and unevenness is what influences Earth's weather and climate. Every single place has a different weather and climate. So what are Earth's ocean currents driven by? Well, temperature, gravity, winds, and the Coriolis effect. What are gyres? Well, 
they are large patterns of water circulation. We're about to talk about what some examples of this are, but they essentially redistribute the heat in the oceans, just like convection currents redistribute the heat in the asthenosphere. So here's the thing. In the northern hemisphere, um, the currents actually run clockwise. So had a clock in front of you. Yep, the currents would run clockwise just like that. Let's say you had the southern hemisphere. Well, they'd run counterclockwise, so like that. An important vocab word here to know is thermohaline circulation. So this drives the mixing of surface water and deep water. It is just like driven by salty surface water where we see the sinking of cold, salty water uh, in high latitudes and the rising of warm water near the equator. And it can take hundreds of years for this to happen, but over time we'll see like water, this, the circulation happen over time where just water moves all around the globe. It can take hundreds of years, y'all, that, that's crazy. Next word to know is upwelling. So here's what upwelling is. It's when surface waters move apart and there is just like an upward movement of water. So like this, this water on the surface moves, but the water from below, it moves upwards. And so upwelling, do you see what I'm getting at? It brings water to the surface that has a lot of nutrients from the bottom of the sea. And this is really important for primary productivity brings lots of nutrients brings lots of biodiversity and we see upwelling occur especially when we have a um, la nina pattern with the wind currents and it's really important here's a problem though um, sometimes the winds reverse and so whenever the winds reverse that begins an el nino um, southern oscillation pattern this usually begins around Christmas, and it can take weeks or years, but ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, it reverses the direction, and it essentially decreases upwelling, and it's overall just not that great for um, biodiversity or productivity, because it decreases upwelling, which happens under the La Nina current, and upwelling is important because it brings up nutrients that are important. And so we see a reversal happen every every so often, and so that's important to know. Okay, everyone, I am powering through just for you, and this last concept I have here is watersheds, and watersheds are all land that drains to a body of water. Let's say I had a bunch of land, and this is the body of water. They all end up going to this watershed, this pool of water. That's what a watershed would be. And important terms to know here is runoff. So runoff is whenever there's water running across land in order to get to that body of water. So before it actually goes into the body of water, the, the water moves across land and then gets the body of water. Here's a problem though. Let's say there was fertilizer in the run on, the runoff. Then that runoff joining the body of water, it can create dead zones because there could be pollution. There could be just bad things in that runoff going into this body of water and it pollutes this watershed and it hurts the plants and animals drinking it. It hurts the humans that might drink it. And so that's an important environmental aspect to know about. And y'all, we're done. Yes. <laughs> okay, so like always, um, at this point, I've understood that, yes, y'all do like these videos and it is helpful. So I will keep creating them. That being said, I have a question for you. I don't have midterms, uh, but I know a lot of other people do. So do you want me to create a midterm review? If you do want me to create a midterm review, make sure to um, like this video. So I know that. And also just comment down below what concepts you most desperately need in the midterm review because I'll try to make it um, like a brief overview of all the most important concepts. And so just like, let me know in the comments down below what you'd like, if you'd even want a midterm review, and I'll create that for you if you'd like. 
And so have a wonderful day. This is Bye Ramya signing off.